Okay, welcome. This webinar is brought to you by the New Hampshire Training Institute on Addictive Disorders. You can access a recording of this webinar on our website at www.nahatica.org. After completing this webinar, please upload and complete the quiz if you are interested in receiving a certificate. You can find the quiz in the file pod throughout this presentation, and you can email or mail it into us at the Training Institute. If you are a member of Nahatica, the certificate for this webinar is free. If you aren't a member, the fee is $15. You will receive a certificate worth one CE once you have completed and passed the quiz, as well as pay for the webinar if applicable. Through the New Hampshire Training Institute on Addictive Disorders, this one-hour event is pre-approved by the New Hampshire Board of Licensing for Alcohol and Other Drug Abuse Professionals, as well as the NBCC. If you have any problems viewing this webinar, audio problems, or any other technical difficulties, please contact us at 603-225-7060 and email any questions regarding the material you see today to the Training Institute at nahatica.org. You can find and upload these introduction slides in the file pod to the right of the screen. Nick Roof here. Thanks for tuning in. I'm going to talk about pain and stress and their interactions with various mental and emotional and addictive disorders this morning. And um, let me start off by telling you um, a couple of studies that are relevant to our purposes for today. <clears throat> the first involves a study done in the late 60s where a researcher was inserting electrodes into rats brains and introducing a very weak electrical pulse on a schedule of once every 30 seconds to the rats brain and the pulse was so weak that the rats brain initially did not respond to the pulse at all none of the neurons connected to the electrode fired back at the uh, stimulus but over time the rats brains um, sensitized to the stimulus and the <clears throat> nerve cells connected to the electrode began to fire in response to the stimulus, and then their neighbors began to respond, and then their neighbors began to respond until the rat began to have epileptic seizures as a result of this little tiny electrical pulse that initially had caused no uh, reaction whatsoever. Then they began to lengthen the time between pulses and weaken the current even further and eventually pulled the electrode out. And after they pulled the electrode out, the rat brain spontaneously began to have epileptic seizures all by itself without any help from the electrode or the external stimulus. The concept is called kindling because it's like when you use kindling to start a fire and once the fire is going, you don't need the kindling anymore. And the concept of kindling has been extrapolated into addictive and other mental health disorders to explain what happens at the end uh, of the progression of the disorders when they kind of lock into place and acquire a life of their own that become really uh, resistant to change or to intervention. <clears throat> the second study involved extremist believers of one sort or another, kind of fanatics. And they took these extremist believers and they put them in an fMRI machine and began to take pictures of their brains when they were fed information at first compatible with their extremist beliefs and then began to slip in information that was incompatible and contrary to their fanatical beliefs. With the input that was compatible with their beliefs, the uh, emotional reward centers of the brains lit up and glowed happily because, of course, they were hearing exactly what they wanted to hear. But with the contrary information that contradicted their um, fanatical beliefs, the cognitive centers of the brain shut down automatically. So the information was never considered. In fact, it was never even let in to be considered. It was shut out completely. And what happens with um, fanatical belief systems is, since they're based on emotion and not on reason or logic in the first place, then to attack those emotional beliefs, 
is to provoke a response from the sympathetic nervous system of um, fight or flight. So what? So if even if you try to apply logic or reasoning to the fanatical belief, it's it's rejected automatically because the person feels attacked and will respond with flight or fight out of the sympathetic nervous system. And so what, what those fanatical beliefs are are closed systems. And closed systems are kindled systems, to kind of get to the um, crux of it here, of what we're talking about. And there's a progression of all of these diseases, um, disorders that we're talking about. I don't think someone um, goes to bed at night and wakes up with a major depressive disorder or an anxiety disorder or um, uh, addictive disorder. I think there's a progression along a line where individuals acquire these disorders and as they progress, um, they get worse and worse until they finally kindle and acquire a life of their a life of their own. So, Elvin Simrad was a teacher of Bessel van der Kolk, whom you may know as a um, one of the um, pr premier um, researchers and um, counselors on um, on stress and trauma. And his teacher said to him that the greatest sources of our suffering are the lies we tell ourselves. Well, when we think about that, I think we've all had the experience of saying something or doing something that we knew was wrong and that we shouldn't have done or said. And in many cases, our first impulse is to justify it or rationalize it or explain it away or something like that to tell ourselves some little lie to make ourselves feel better and cover up the pain, run a, kind of escape from the pain we feel because we've done something wrong. And those little lies that we tell ourselves, the little white lies that we tell ourselves to justify or rationalize the um, um, the, the error that we made, what, the, what that little lie does is it releases dopamine into the nucleus accumbens and other reward and reinforcement centers of the brain just exactly the way that drugs of abuse or other addictive behaviors do. So it gives ourselves a little bit of um, comfort um, by telling ourselves that little white lie. At the same time, that creates a dissociation in our systems between what's real and what's true and the little house of cards that we're building up with our lies. And of course, those lies can become stronger and stronger and stronger and build this entire edifice of a denial system or a delusional system or perhaps even a, um, even an, a disorder. Um, such as a depressive disorder or an anxiety disorder that's really based on untruths that the person has um, told him or herself and then comes to believe in. So when we look at, at pain medications, the prob one of the problems with the opiates and opioids is, of course, that they're highly addictive and that they um, that you build up a tolerance to these drugs, so it takes more and more of the drug to provide any relief from the pain. And at the same time, our systems get more and more sensitized to the signals for pain, um, which require the need of the drug. So as you become more tolerant to the drug on the one hand, you become more sensitive to the pain signals on the other hand, requiring more medication. So that's a really nasty and vicious circle that people get caught up in. And these um, opioids or opiates all across the board mimic our neurotransmitters, the endorphins, and pretend to be endorphins. And as our systems become accustomed to the drug from outside, the endorphin system begins to close down. So when we take the drug away, the endorphin system is not producing as much endorphins as it did. So the system feels craving for the balance or equilibrium or homeostasis of, of the system, sets up that craving, and the person goes out and acquires more drug rather than waiting for the system to rebalance or recalibrate itself.
There are various um, pain-killing drugs besides the opiates, of course. There's tramadol, and that works on other neurotransmitters besides the um, endorphins to relieve pain. Um, there are um, other pain meds. Um, before I do that, let, 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 let's look at that little um, um, parenthetical phrase right under other pain meds that 50% of individuals with mood disorders suffer from chronic pain? Well, emotional pain and physical pain are registered in the same part of the brain. So there's a big crossover between the two. And they've done studies with people where um, um, strategies like mindfulness intervention has been shown over the course of maybe eight weeks to reduce physical pain in clients by maybe 20%, which means they can move from an eight on that 10 point pain scale to a six, which is not insignificant. So one of the um, chemicals in cannabis is cannabidiol, and there has been shown some um, analgesic effects uh, from can cannabidiol as well on pain, as well as THC, the other ingredient in cannabis, also has some pain regulating um, effects. N low dose nortriptyline, nortriptyline is a tricyclic antidepressant. It also has some um, pain killing effects. And there are drugs that have anaxiolytic, antidepressant, and analgesic effects all at the same time. So they can relieve depression, they can relieve anxiety, and they can uh, relieve pain, physical pain. So there are parts of our brain that moderate all of, all of these effects. So if we take drugs like Cymbalta or drugs like Stratera, then they are working on serotonin, which is 5-HT, because serotonin's chemical name is 5-hydroxytryptamine, and on norepinephrine, which is our brain's um, adrenaline, so by increasing the activity and supply availability of those neurotransmitters, it provides some pain relief. And the same with Stratera, although Stratera is a selective norepinephrine or noradrenaline reuptake inhibitor, increasing the availability and activity of <clears throat> norepinephrine. There are the PAMs and the, the positive allosteric moder modulators work on secondary pain receptors instead of on the primary ones. Um, when there's spillover, that means that there are non-targeted effects, side effects of most drugs because all of the neurotransmitters in our systems have sub receptor subtypes. So serotonin has maybe 14 different uh, receptor subtypes and they mediate everything from nausea to contextual sensitivity to mood regulation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So by targeting these secondary pain receptors rather than the primary ones, you get a much more targeted um, effect from the drug. So the PAMs am um, amplify anandamide and 2-AG, which are two um, endogenous um, cannabinoids in our system. Our, our system produces those as neurotransmitters <clears throat> and delivers them at the right time to the right place. Oh, and at the bottom, ibuprofen plus acetaminophen is just as effective as opioids for acute pain. That means Tylenol and Advil and things like that. Just as effective for acute pain. Brain modules, well, we have time to just run through briefly some of the parts of our brain that are affected by these various disorders that we're discussing today. The prefrontal cortex is kind of the major um, executive part of our brain once we have a mature brain, which occurs somewhere in our mid-20s, cognitive control. And really what we're talking about with these um, disorders that we're discussing today, we're talking about emotional dysregulation of the system. And through counseling and therapy, and in some cases medication, what we're doing is helping clients move from emotional dysregulation to emotional regulation. And that means more power to the prefrontal cortex. The anterior cingulate cortex, um, the back or nor the uh, northern part of it, has to do with cognitive control, picks up errors in our system, and activated by mo both physical and emotional pain. And I mentioned that earlier. 
and the southern part of the anterior cingulate has to do with emotional and motivational salience, how much, how important is it, how much value are we going to give it, how relevant is it to us. The posterior cingulate is called the default mode network. The default mode network is where people with anxiety and people with depression, once they've kindled, end up stuck. So the increasing grip that the disorder has on the person finally tightens to the point where it kindles, it gets down into the default mode network and the person can't stop worrying and can't stop ruminating. They just go over and over and over the things that they need to be afraid of are going to happen. And, the, and in the depressive disorders of the things that are wrong and the things that um, make life um, miserable and all those things in that default mode network just grabs a hold of the individual and becomes kind of the, um, the dissociated component of that person. The default mode network is deactivated during meditation and through sustained concentration. The insula connects the mind and body. Mindfulness meditation practices increase the uh, capacity of the insula. It, it grows new nerve cells with mindfulness meditation. And as I said, it, and also one of the great things about that is it, it deactivates the default mode network, which is just kind of our brain just doing what it does. So even if we don't have anxiety or depression, um, we can still spend an awful lot of time just kind of in mental drift and daydreaming and stuff like that where our mind isn't really um, engaged with our brain. The nucleus accumbens used to be thought to be the kind of site for dopamine release in the pleasure cascade in the brain. And the, but the nucleus accumbens really has to do with motivation. And what happens with a lot of disorders, especially the addictive disorders, is as they detach from, as the, as the behavior detaches from its result, it gets um, stimulated, the disorder, the behavior gets stimulated more and more by the motivation. So the motivation is there based on the prediction of the reward, which of course in decreasingly happens with the progression of the addictive disorders. The amygdala is the emotional center um, of the brain. It records and responds to emotions. The amygdala sensitizes in um, addictive disorders and in anxiety disorders, so it gets better and better at picking up cues um, to, um, to signify either fear in the case of anxiety, for example, or um, craving in the case of the um, uh, addictive disorders. The hippocampus is a memory center under st chronic stress um, the hippocampus shrinks, it act, cells actually atrophy, so the hippocampus gets smaller and smaller. That happens in depression as well, so that the person's um, world becomes smaller and darker as the uh, <clears throat> disorder progresses. The hypothalamus regulates things like eating, sleeping, sexual behavior, moods, fatigue, things like that. And it runs on sets. It, it, all, there are settings in our system for all of those different functions. And those settings are reset in disorders like depression and anxiety. So what happens to a person with depression? What happens to their appetite? Well, it either decreases or increases, gets out of control. Sleeping, they either want to sleep all the time or they can't sleep at all. Um, libido, sex drive, either hyperactive or hypoactive. Mood is obviously reset in those disorders. So those disorders, as they kindle, reset all of those functional um, settings. The HPA axis is the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis, uh, releasing corticosteroids and cortisol, which are stress hormones, and increasing stress to the system. Now, stress comes as a result of a disruption of homeostasis, that balance or equilibrium of the system. And short-term short -term stress is good for us. Um, short-term stress would be like you get hungry. 
and that's a disruption of your homeostasis or balance. So you go get something to eat, and when you have something to eat, the stress goes away and you return the system to homeostasis. And that homeostasis our systems have a great investment in because chronic disruptions of homeostasis, a highly stressed system, is a system at considerable risk, not just for psychological and emotional disorders, but for physical disorders as well. <clears throat> Stressful events, talk about um, adverse childhood events here. Um, Nadine Burke Harris's TED Talk is just wonderful. Um, she says one out of eight children has four or more adverse childhood um, events. Well, you know what the definition of normal is, right? Normal is whatever happens to you often enough so your system adapts to it and be, that becomes homeostasis for your system. It doesn't mean it's good. It doesn't mean it's healthy. It just means it's happened regularly enough and become normal for your particular system. And these adverse childhood events affect the nucleus accumbens, motivational functions, the prefrontal cortex, the executive functions, and the amygdala, emotional functions, and their development and expression in that child. Um, they affect the um, HPA axis and stress levels. Health outcomes across the board are effective, both physical and mental, so that there's an elevated risk for heart disease, asthma, suicide, substance use disorders, mental and emotional disorders. So while we're equipped and built for short-term stress, and it offers us an opportunity to learn new things and to um, explore the world, chronic stress is a killer. <clears throat> So psychological and emotional pain and physical pain all expressed in, uh, re uh, registered in the same part of the brain. So we get the negative feelings and fear, depression, um, experiences of neglect or abuse, trauma in the background or adverse childhood events, bullying, violence, poverty, lack of opportunity, death of a parent, of a sibling, or divorce. And then the lies that the person begins with are, they're my fault. This is the pain. It's my fault. There's something wrong with me. Setting up that shame, self-loathing, low self-esteem and alienation, the shoulda, coulda, woulda. Uh, think of all the clients who have um, substance use disorders and how many of them say, you know, I never, I never felt like I... I fit. I, I always did. I never felt comfortable in my own skin. I was always really shy or self-conscious and look on kind of on the outside looking in. And then they find um, the alcohol or the other drug of abuse and all of a sudden they feel fixed. And of course the current thinking about substance use disorders and other addictive disorders is that they begin with self-medication. That's the hook. You feel better. It acts as a medication. It acts kind of like that lie, just um, delivering dopamine to the, uh, to the nucleus accumbens. <clears throat> Here's a discussion question. Opioids work on the neurotransmitter um, on the endorphins. We've discussed the endorphins and how all of the opioids and opiates mimic the endorphins. They're shaped chemically just like them, and so our systems take the um, the opioid or the opiate as if it were endorphins, but the more opiate, the fewer endorphins. So there's the problem. And some systems um, in opioid-dependent individuals will recover. The endorphin system will get back in, um, online with um, risk recovery. It takes a while. In other cases, the person needs to be maintained on medication um, like methadone or something like that because there's something broken in their endorphin system. And whether it was broken initially, and that's one of the predisposing factors for the addiction in the first place, or whether the addiction broke the endorphin system, we don't know because we don't have a baseline. But in those cases, they need to be maintained on the methadone. And as we know, there are people who've been maintained on methadone for upwards of 30 years. Well, the cure becomes the problem, and I'll say more about that as we go along, but a, a substance use and other addictive disorders, depression, anxiety, OCD. So the attempt to deal with the pain, the self-medication, which at first seems to work and provide some solace and some comfort, eventually becomes the problem itself. Um, I put um, OCD in there, which we'll also talk about in a, in a minute, because I think I can um, 
describe it even more clearly in the case of OCD. And remember our system's commitment to homeostasis and to deal with stress through our defenses so we get denial and excusing and rationalization and dissociation and fantasy and blame and humor and all of those, th of those attempts to ward off the pain, to ward off the pain. Another thing that Bessel van der Kolk's teacher said to him was that you cannot be psychologically and emotionally healthy and whole until you know what you know and you feel what you feel. So eventually that pain has to be faced. You, you just can't run away for it forever and it begins to um, create pain rather than ease the pain. <clears throat> so the easy fix, the dissociation, um, there's the denial of feelings through uh, suppression or deadening of the feelings through avoidance strategies, lies and humor, through, uh, escape uh, fantasizing, through self-fulfilling prophecies, through substance use. There's the denial of responsibility, making excuses, rationalizing, blaming. There's the denial of implication, uh, minimizing, discounting, or dismissing, and the denial of fact. Uh, it simply didn't happen. It wasn't me. It meant nothing. <clears throat> so that, <clears throat> those are those dissociation, <clears throat> excuse me, denial elements of all of these disorders that we're talking about. <clears throat> so there's the pain of being wrong. <clears throat> registered in the anterior cingulate and the, ins and the insula. And then the little white lie to cover up, rationalize, excuse it, to feel better, to avoid, to repress, to escape the pain, delivering a little shot of dopamine to the nucleus accumbens. And then that sets up that cognitive dissonance. And that cognitive dissonance is the dissociation. That's the split between the reality of the situation and that delusional system that can develop into the whole <clears throat> dissociated entity that has a, lot, a life of its own. Maybe you've had the experience of, if you drive the same route to work and home every day, of, you know, you're driving to or from work, but you're not thinking about your driving, you're on automatic pilot, and you're thinking about what to do at work or what to do at home, or where you'd like to go on vacation, or how the Red Sox are going to do next year, or whatever. And some distance down the road, you come back to yourself and kind of catch up and reorient yourself as to where you are on the, on the road to work or to home. But for a while, you've just been driving on automatic pilot without your brain, your mind being engaged in the task. <clears throat> And as we know, people can drive cars in alcoholic blackouts where the um, executive functions, the top um, parts of their brains are anesthetized completely and non-operative and the person can drive a car. So that program can run itself autonomously because after you drive for enough miles, driving Kindles <clears throat> becomes an automatic, autonomic um, behavior that you can run without your mind being engaged in it. Um, the same thing happens once you learn to ride a bicycle. You know, you can go 50 years without riding a bicycle and somebody gives you a bicycle and you hop on and pedal off because your system has got that program <clears throat> intact, stored and dormant in your system. And once it's reactivated, it plays itself out and it plays itself out completely, not part by part by part where you remember how to pedal, but you don't remember how to steer the bicycle. <clears throat> or in the case of driving, you remember how to start the car, but you don't remember how the pedals work. The whole program <clears throat> gets stored intact. And that, of course, is what happens when um, with disorders like depression or um, a de a de um, dependence and substance use disorders. That whole program is dormant in the system and can be reactivated intact once it's, once it's reactivated, once it's stimulated back into... Um, back into reality. So a person who gives up drinking or drugging or gambling or some other addiction, when that disorder is reactivated, it comes back intact. So the person picks up where he or she left off. They don't start back over at square one. So those little dissociations or those little, I don't know, sometimes I think of them, they're like avatars of our system. They, um, they can be reactivated intact. So in dissociation, we talk about cognitive dissonance, which we've mentioned, 
dissociative identity disorder, which used to be called multiple personality disorder, where you get actual different people living within, um, within the same person. So these little avatars or these little dissociated states exist within the same person. Uh, we get state-dependent learning. We get blackouts. We get muscle memory. Think of the Olympic um, gymnast, right, on the balance beam. And before she does the um, front flip, you do think she's thinking about, now let's see, where does my left foot want to come down on the balance beam? No, she doesn't do that. She hears the bell to go and it just turn, up, turn off your brain and run the whole thing on automatic pilot. Because if you start thinking about it, you're going to blow it. The same way with playing a musical instrument or a performance or something like that. You don't think about it, you do it. And you keep your brain out of it because your brain is going to tinker with it and mess it up. I talked earlier about the fanatical belief systems, um, extremist beliefs like cult membership. Um, cult membership are, are kindled um, belief systems. And they resist change and they resist input because the emotional basis belief system is so kindled and so closed that nothing from outside gets in that um, uh, contradicts its premises. <clears throat> Mental disorders like depression and anxiety may well be kindled disorders and they may well be these dissociative states. Addiction the same way. If you talk to people who are in sustained recovery from addictive disorders, they will say, and many of the people who have known them and loved them over the years will say, that they're a different person. They're not the same person. And they will say that of themselves. And people who have recovered from depression or anxiety will say the same. I'm not, I'm not the same as I was. I'm not the same person I was. So these all may be dissociated um, states that have an existence of their own, but there are other versions of us besides those. So habits are obviously <clears throat> um, kindled, closed systems, hypnosis, third person self-talk. I put that in there because one of the things we can help people with addictive disorders and perhaps um, uh, with other um, psychological emotional disorders as well in, in preventing relapse is when they feel the symptoms coming on, when they feel recognize a cue or something like that, if they say, oh, there's X, and they talk about themselves, there's Mary having a craving. Oh, there's Mary beginning to be self-critical. Oh, there's Mary beginning to worry about things. And that distancing and objectifying of the response can sometimes provide room to make a different decision and not go down that road. Already stressed systems will seek relief through repression, avoidance, aggression, anxiety, depression, anger, impulsivity, PTSD. So there's the fear, there's the sensitized amygdala, and the sympathetic nervous system fight or flight. What happens in a disorder like PTSD is that the individual gets the emotional uh, cue or stimulus. So let's say the uh, combat veteran um, hears a helicopter or a backfiring car, and that emotional stimulus goes to the sensory thal thalamus, which is the gateway for all incoming sensory um, input to our systems. And then it goes immediately over to the amygdala for emotional response, which of course is to freak out, and then to the, and then to the emotional response of fight, flight, or freeze, that sympathetic nervous system PTSD response. And the stimulus never gets up into the prefrontal cortex, particularly the medial prefrontal cortex, for processing and integration into the system. So the combat veteran with PTSD is constantly reliving the traumatic event rather than remembering the traumatic event, and that is such a difference. <clears throat> They've done studies with rats where they'll um, traumatize the rat by ringing a little bell and shocking its foot. Not seriously shocking it, but shocking enough to scare the rat. And so eventually the rat begins to respond to the bell as if it signals the foot shock, even though the foot shock is no longer delivered to the rat. And as long as the rat's medial prefrontal cortex is intact, it will eventually decondition to the bell and stop responding as if it's going to get a foot shock. But if you deactivate the medial prefrontal cortex, 
that rat never deconditions. It always responds to the bell as if it's going to get a foot shock forever and ever and ever. So one of the things that needs to happen with uh, victims of PTSD, sufferers of PTSD, is it has to get up into those higher centers of the brain for processing. And that's what um, gradual exposure therapy does. That's what EMDR and the other psychomotor um, interventions and strategies um, work on and processing in the uh, treatment of PTSD and are effective. Chronic stress, here's how it happens. It gets into a vicious cycle. Our chronic stress um, boosts cortisol, that stress hormone levels, and down-regulates. That means there are fewer receptor sites on the nerve cells to, um, to, re, to, um, um, to, to accept the cortisol. So because <clears throat> there's, there are fewer receptors, the system doesn't recognize that there's a flood and oversupply of cortisol in the system, so the pituitary and adrenals don't react, and the adrenals keep pouring cortisol into the system, pouring cortisol into the system, and as we've seen, cortisol erodes the system. It kills brain cells. It um, causes heart disease and all kinds of um, health problems. Closed systems, as I said, we're talking about kindled systems here. There are kindled extremist beliefs. A denial system is a closed system. Self-fulfilling prophecies are closed systems. Our homeostasis is to some degree a closed system, although it can be fairly easily disrupted through stressful events. Conditioning is um, our closed systems where you condition um, the rat to respond to the bell with a foot shock, uh, with um, expect a foot shock. State dependent learning, cults, and muscle, muscle memory, all of these are um, closed or kindled systems. Addiction in the brain. Well, there's the initial uh, uh, prediction error which means that the effect of the drug or the gambling or the whatever the behavior or substance is, is so much better than expected. Um, so there's a prediction error there that causes the release of the dopamine into the nucleus accumbens. And um, as I said, what they, the current thinking about substance and other addictive disorders is that the beginning um, reinforcement is self-medication. The person feels fixed in some sort of way. So we start off with liking it because you get that tremendous reward or relief supplied by the drug, and that's the liking stage of the disorder. And the ventral tegmental area, which is a feed, a feed dopamine into the system a part of the brain, sends dopamine to the nucleus accumbens for, motiv uh, for motivation and to the prefrontal cortex to like it and register it as, uh, as pleasurable or relieving. And then the endorphins are released in the nucleus accumbens, also leading to liking the response. Now, they've done studies with rats where they um, specifically bred the rats for alcohol preference, and they're called pea rats. And what they do is they take a litter of baby rats and they give them a choice between pure water and a 10% alcohol solution in the liquid. And some of the rats like the pure water and some of the rats like the alcohol solution. So then they breed together the rats that like the water and they breed together the rats that like the alcohol. And after 10 or 20 generations, since you were breeding them for one genetic variable, and that was alcohol preference, you got some teetotaling rats on the one hand, and you got some drinking rats on the other hand. Now, the first time that the alcohol-preferring rats got enough alcohol to do anything for them, their brains released dopamine and endorphins into those pleasure motivational centers of the brain that the pea rats never got. So for that vulnerable, predisposed system, the alcohol is a, is a different drug. It's, it's like it's supplying cocaine through the dopamine release and heroin through the endorphin release on top of the sedative, hypnotic, and anesthetic effects of the alcohol that everybody who drinks is going to get. And so if you talk to people who don't have an alcohol problem about if, um, getting drunk, they don't like to get, get drunk. 
It's aversive to them because they're getting too much of a sedative hypnotic, too much of an anesthetic. That's aversive to their system. But that is overwhelmed, not just compensated for, but overwhelmed in those P systems by the release of dopamine and, um, and endorphins. So we've got us liking the substance or the behavior. Now the P P prefrontal cortex is going to react to cues predicting the reward or the relief. Um, you know, the Bud Light commercial on TV um, leading to the dopamine spike that now comes not as a result of the drinking or addictive behavior, but it comes as a, as a response to the cue predicting the behavior. And this is where the behavior begins to detach from its results. So this is when you want it. So if the first part of the experience is the meal, then the second part run by the cues is the menu. So now you're running on the prediction of the, of the reward or the relief. And so the conditioning of the cues predicting the reward deepens the pathway for the be addictive behavior and sensitization picking up more and more cues. So there's not just the Bud Light commercial, but there's the Clydesdale horses um, predicting the drinking. And there's the over the hump day and the there's thanks God it's Friday and there's this and there's that. So you you broaden your sensitivity to picking up cues that predict that reward or relief. And with that increased motivation, with the intermittent reinforcement, because of course sometimes cues are accurate in their prediction and sometimes they're inaccurate. So sometimes it works out and sometimes it doesn't. Intermittent reinforcement is the most powerful reinforcement schedule. You can string a rat's behavior, and maybe um, humans as well, out forever on just the off chance that maybe this time it'll pay off. If you watch people with a gambling problem at the slot machines, you'll see that they it doesn't matter whether the particular quarter that they put in the slot machine wins or loses, because if it wins, they're not going to quit because they're on a winning streak, and who's going to interrupt a winning streak? And if they lose, they're not going to quit because they're another quarter deeper in debt, and now they've got to play to make up for the additional loss and, and get their money back, so they're caught up in that in that vicious cycle of addiction of um, it doesn't matter what the outcome of the behavior is, the behavior is driven by the motivation and the cues and the prediction of the possible reward maybe this time. So if we start a rat out um, pushing a button to get cocaine every other time it pushes the button and then once every 10 times it gets cocaine when it pushes the button then once every 100 times then once every 500 times then once every 1000 times that rat will keep pushing that button almost forever just on the off chance that this time it's going to work and that's the movement from liking to wanting to needing so that increased in motivation with intermittent reinforcement drives loss of control over the behavior. And with the addictive behavior, there are two levels of loss of control. The first is the loss of control over the amount of the substance or the behavior. So the person means to have a couple of drinks and goes on a three-day bender. Or the person means to go to the casino and spend a hundred bucks and ends up spending ten thousand bucks. So there's that loss of control over the amount of the substance or behavior. The second loss of control is over the initiation of the behavior so that that more kindled level of the disorder, the person will drink or gamble even in spite of swearing and promising and willing not to. So the person with the substance use disorder has a court hearing or a hearing with um, a family system about getting his or her kids back. And so they know they can't um, drink or use during that, um, during that time. But the stress level, of course, is highest at that time. And stress is one of the causes of relapse. And so in spite of willing themselves and promising they're not going to drink or use, they drink or use anyhow. And that using um, that, that loss of control over initiation of the behavior is, um, is a kindled and is, a, um, is an element of the needing part of the disorder where it, the, the disorder is totally detached 
from its outcome. <clears throat> So here's kind of the addiction picture here. We start off with a pleasure or relief, but then your system bias, um, you, so your system bias means it kind of tips toward, look, every time you see a menu, you look and see if that particular dish that was so wonderful is offered on the menu. And so then you get the cue, oh, they've got that dish, I'm gonna order it. And sometimes it's just as good as you thought it was, but sometimes it's not as good as you thought it was. So you get that intermittent reinforcement schedule, which is very powerful. And of course, if it's just as good, then the behavior is reinforced because it's just as good. So it, so it strengthens that pathway. And you would think that with failure that you would give up on it, but that's not the way that, that it works. Failure is reinforcing in and of itself because it sets up stress, it sets up craving, it sets up denial, it sets up increased motivational dopamine because if there's a 100% chance that the reward is going to come, you get a dopamine spike. If there's only a 50-50 chance it's going to pay off and you get the reward, you get double the motivational dopamine spike because, of course, um, if you know where your next meal is coming from, you get hungry, you go eat. So there's some motivation and some dopamine spike there. If you don't know where your next meal is coming from, you need more motivation and you've got motivation. In fact, if it's a 50-50 chance, you've got twice as much dopamine, motivational dopamine driving that behavior. So failure actually reinforces the behavior. Um, it adds stress. It um, adds an overvaluation of the predicted reward. So for the person with alcoholism, oh God, what a day today has been. I really need a drink. And really, realistically, how much is that drink going to do? But it's overestimated. The payoff is overestimated. And that overestimation leads to a sensitized amygdala to pick up the cues predicting the reward and sensitized nucleus accumbens to increase motivation with uncertainty, eventually at the far end of the sensitization and the motivation is kindling where the behavior breaks off from the control of the individual and you get the stereotyped autonomous compulsive behavior that we are familiar with and we see our clients caught up in. I mentioned earlier that I was going to use OCD as an example and demonstration of how the cure becomes the problem, <clears throat> and I think OCD is a good example. Let's say that the compulsive behavior is hand washing. So the person washes his or her hands, and as soon as they dry their hands off, they say to themselves, Maybe I didn't get them all. Maybe I've still got some germs on my hands. So that kind of doubt triggers anxiety in their system that maybe it doesn't work, and so they get that anxiety about having germs on your hands. The anxiety triggers obsessive perseveration where you can't get it out of your head that your hands are still dirty. You go over it and over and over it in the um, default mode network. <clears throat> that obsessive um, perseveration triggers stress sensitization to cues where you can feel the germs crawling on your hands, and overestimation of payoff. Maybe if I use a stronger soap and wash my hands for a half hour instead of 20 minutes, I'll get them clean. And then the stress and the sensitization and the overestimation, all of those trigger the compulsive behavior, and around and around you go so that the, the, so that the cure is the problem. And we see the same thing, of course, in the um, um, addictive disorders. Depression, comprising emotional and um, psychological pain. <clears throat> the lie, I can turn down my feelings so it doesn't hurt. I can take it. That's the cognitive part. Uh, temporary relief through long-term depression of the system, just shutting things down and slowing them down. Building up a tolerance to take the, um, the bad, um, you know, and um, flattened affect at the emotional level. And a reset of the hypothalamus, remember all those functions for eating and sleeping and sexual behavior, reset all of those at the behavioral level. <clears throat> and the medial prefrontal cortex gains influence over the default mode network. And the default mode network takes over with the ruminations and worrying and all those components of depression. 
and there's low um, dopamine in the nucleus accumbens, so that means there's um, lower levels of motivation for the person. And one of the most effective treatments for depression is, um, is um, activity, um, getting them up and do behavioral activation therapy, where you get the person to go for a walk, get the person to shoot hoops or uh, play a game of eight ball or do something, but it's so hard to get them, and if they can do it, they feel better after they do it. That activates the system, but the motivational level, it's so low, it's hard to get them to actually initiate the, uh, the activity. Depression in the brain, you get a hyperactive amygdala, you get a smaller hippocampus because <clears throat> um, the atrophy of those hippocampal cells and reduced striatal, that's the nucleus accumbens, connectivity and response to reward. So even when good things happen to a person with depression, they're not really registered in any sort of meaningful way. It's like a drop of good things in a whole bucket of depression. So they just don't register in any sort of meaningful or therapeutic way in terms of relieving the depression. Because, of course, the depression is a closed system, so they're not going to let it in. Well, you know, you got a really good present for your birthday. Yeah, but. You know, it's a beautiful day out. Yeah, but it's going to get cold tomorrow, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It just rejects the, uh, the positives. So depression begins with self-criticism where you turn on yourself and begin to get down on yourself and take a, take it personally. And that's the fight part of you fight yourself, the sympathetic nervous system. Then there's the self-isolation, which is the flight, because you're such a loser, who'd want to, who's want, who'd want to hang around with you? You don't want people to see you because you're such an undesirable person. So that's the flight element of the sympathetic nervous system. And there's this, then there's the self-absorption where you just kind of collapse into yourself. And that's the freeze, collapse, passivity, despair, um, dissociated um, component of the depression. And that's run by the parasympathetic nervous system, which is... Um, which is at the point where the person is quite capable of suicide. So at the emotional level, there's sadness. At the belief cognitive level, there's worthlessness. And at the memory level, there's neglect or abuse. Which reminds me, I attached links to a few um, uh, videos at the end of the presentation, and I hope you'll take a look at them because I think they're pretty, pretty interesting. Anxiety, and there's a cycle of anxiety, the same way a closed circle, um, beginning with fear, the lie we tell ourselves, I can anticipate the threat and avoid it um, through amygdala sensitization to pick up those cues predicting bad things are coming, low um, um, nucleus accumbens activity, uh, so low motivation again, and neutral stimuli are anaxiogenic. They, they, they produce anxiety in that person. And so if you show them pictures of people with neutral expressions on their face, the person will, with anxiety will read those neutral expre uh, expressions as threatening or angry because they're transporting out into the external world their fears and anxieties and pasting them out there onto the world. And then they get the feedback from their own projections back into them justifying the, uh, the disorder. And once again, you get the reset of all of those hypothalamic um, setting, settings for mood and sleep and eating and all the rest of those things. So here's another discussion question. Chronic stress can cause brain areas to atrophy. Well, yes, we talked about the hippocampus. We talked about the prefrontal cortex. So it definitely can cause brain areas to atrophy, and that means that there is actual loss of brain matter in those areas of the brain. Fortunately, we can also grow new brain cells through neurogenesis and things like mindfulness, meditation, exercise, things like that can increase our, our brain matter and we can grow new brain cells. And here's parts of the brain that are involved in that uh, fear response, the sensory cortex, because you've got to let things in, sense things, um, those cues, the thalamus, the gateway, 
the hypothalamus for those settings, the amygdala for the emotional response, and the hippocampus for the memory. We often see anxiety and depression in the same person, and what they have in common is lower, lowered levels of serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine, deactivation of cognitive control brain regions, so the anterior cingulate and prefrontal cortex lose control over the emotions, that emotional deregulation which we talked about. There's higher emotional reactivity through amygdala sensitization, greater activity in the default mode network as it begins to take over the person, um, higher memory processing in the hippocampus of all the bad things or the things to be afraid of, and um, both reflect higher salience and inability to govern the ruminations or worries, um, giving them more relevance and more meaning in one's life. And then, once again, the resetting of the hypothalamic controls. Leonard Cohen says that there's a crack in everything, and that's how the light gets in. Well, we've got these closed, kindled systems, so where, how are we going to help people? There's a Buddhist saying that the blind don't need light, they need eyes. So just increasing the intensity of the light we're shining doesn't help the blind person. The blind person needs eyes to see. And in many of the cases, that's the, that's the same thing with the dissociated state we're dealing with, with individuals with major depression disorder, general anxiety disorder, or addictive disorders. They're locked in in the grip of that closed system, kindled disorder, and we need to find a crack that begins to loosen the grip a little bit for that person and enables them to open up a little bit to, um, to alternatives in their, in their lives and enlarge their repertoire and choices in their lives. So our brains secrete thoughts and feelings just like our stomachs secrete digestive juices. Brains are made to uh, secrete these thoughts and feelings because of all of our habits and all of our experiences and events in our lives and our desires and our memories and all those things. But our brains don't, um, but our minds don't have to be engaged with our brains. In fact, our brains are often running on automatic and they're just kind of going on and doing what brains do automatically without our, um, without our attending to them or being particularly aware of them. So one of the things that, thing, that mindfulness meditation practices do is bring our mind to our brains. And as we do that, we see that we have control over our thoughts and feelings. We don't have to buy in. We can say, oh, that's just my brain um, daydreaming about this. Oh, that's just my brain. Um, oh, that's my brain be, um, being self-critical. I should probably, I'm not going to engage in being um, self-critical of myself because I know that leads to my depression. So I'm not going to do that. Oh, that's a butt ad on TV and that makes Nick want to go and have a drink. That's Nick's addiction talking to him and that's a cue and Nick can um, choose to follow that or not. He doesn't have to follow it like Pavlov's dog salivating at the sound of a bell because these cues work on a very simple um, biological premise, and that is what, what fires together wires together in our brains. So if you take a neutral or um, weak uh, stimulus and you pair it with a strong stimulus, then the weak stimulus gets strong. That's what happens with PTSD. That's what happens with um, cues for relapse with substance abuse disorders or cues for relapse into anxiety or depression or any of those. So one of the things we can do is to strengthen the insula and that involves neurogenesis and actually thickening, thickening of it. Um, the insula um, thins out. You lose insula matter and mass with disorders like schizophrenia, and specific phobias and PTSD, all of those thin the insula out. But mindfulness meditation actually adds brain cells to the, to the uh, insula. So there are these convergent lines coming together in the, in the research world and in the practical world as well. Hypnosis, placebos, um, 
CBT. Now placebos, you can have what they call open um, open label placebos, and that means you tell the person, oh, this is a placebo antidepressant, and you explain how placebos work, that they're inert substances um, that have no effect in and of themselves, but this is, and this is an um, antidepressant placebo. And open label placebos are just as effective as double blind placebos. So even though the person knows it's a placebo, it can still be effective. Placebos turn out to be more effective the more, the better the person is able to self-regulate emotionally. So with that strengthening of emotional regulation, there's a better placebo response. There's research on the psychedelics of psilocin, magic mushrooms, LSD, ketamine, MDNA, and all of these drugs, because they mimic serotonin, lead to what's called a contextual sensitization. You become more aware of what's going on around you and less absorbed in the default mode network of your own stuff. So it kind of dissolves those ego barriers that um, can prevent our access, our accessing the world and open us up to new experiences and open us up to the context in which we find ourselves as well as um, putting us in touch with the present and with our bodies. And all the stuff on meditation, I mean, there's a ton of things with um, stress reduction and relapse prevention and then acceptance and commitment and the mindfulness-oriented recovery enhancement where the eight-week program reduced pain severity and chronic pain opioid abusing clients at a three-month follow-up. There's all the research on the transcranial low uh, voltage brain stimulation, neurofeedback, and all those things where they attach electrodes to your brain and give you a little electrical stimulation to various parts of the brain. Plus, of course, there's all the research on the dangers, side effects, and ineffectiveness of psychotropic meds like the opiates, like the benzodiazepines, like Valium and Xanax and Ativan and Clonopin, and of the antidepressants. Um, about 75% of antidepressant effect is placebo effect in mild and moderate, and moderate depression. Antidepressants have their major effect uh, medically, um, physically, on severe depression. Here's a description of mindfulness meditation. The globally reduced functional interdependence between, between brain regions in meditation suggests that interaction between the self-process functions is minimized and that strengths in the self-process by other processes are minimized, thereby leading to the subjective experience of non-involvement, detachment, and letting go, as well as of all oneness and dissolution of ego borders during meditation. And here is a little closing video. Thanks for tuning in. Be well.